Hi guys, welcome to another Learning Electronics Repair video. This video is sponsored by Miniware, who sent me this handheld mini oscilloscope for free. I'm not being paid to make this review video. I will give an honest opinion of this item, what I actually think of it. But before I can do that, I guess we have to open the box and have a look to see what's inside it, yeah? So, it's nicely sealed as you can see. Just uh, get in here. There we go. And there we have it, DS213 Mini Oscilloscope Manual, yeah. This, sometimes you see them advertise or say they're four channel oscilloscopes. It has two analog and two digital channels. So really it is a two channel oscilloscope. 15 megahertz bandwidth, which really should be enough for most sort of repair work unless you're into radio frequency, VHF and such like repair. So it probably be hopefully quite a useful repair tool. So we have the instruction book I just quickly had a look at. It seems to be, yeah, it's like kind of like that ends back to front and it's in Chinese. And then this end this way is in English. And I'm sure there are other language manuals available. So I won't bother with that just now. Let's actually have a look at this oscilloscope itself. And there's some more bits in here. Oh, yeah, look at that. So we have a USB lead, quite possibly for the power. But we can try to attach it to a PC. And we have the oscilloscope. This is like metal. It's like an aluminium case. So we have the connection for the USB. I'll have to try and find a power to put into that. Unless it has a battery built in, let's see. Oh yeah, look. Came ready, charged up. Oh, it is working then. And the battery is basically charged by the looks of it. Well, it's certainly booted up fast. That's the first thing I'll say. It's also very small. So I will zoom the camera down and we can have a closer look at it. Okay, so there's the oscilloscope. The screen is quite reflective. I just tilted there away from the actual lights. You can see fairly clearly. Now I have overhead lighting on my bench. We have channel A, channel B, inputs and out. This has a built-in signal generator as well. And I've also just noticed it has a screen protector. So let's take this off it. And now see how the display looks. Yeah, a little bit sharp as you would expect without the screen protector on. Okay. It came with the scope probe kits. These look like pretty much standard uh, scope probes. Very well held in there, by the way. Difficult to get the thing out. I will in a minute. One times, ten times scope probes. Okay. But they have these funny little connectors on, so they're not like a normal BNC connector that you would expect to find on a scope probe. There's something little pushing connectors by the looks of them. Okay. Little uh, colored rings so you can identify probe one and probe two. No doubt. I'm not sure they actually correspond to the color on the screen, the space. They may do to some extent. Oh yeah, it's got a yellow and a green and a, a cyan and a magenta. I'll just switch that off a moment. So we have some little uh, clips. We have a little Allen key for something. Uh, and we have some of these little uh, rings, which I'm sure we can actually attach to our scope probe like so. So that's what I'm guessing, yeah, they kind of like open up. And I'm assuming these are just so that when you're working on something, you can easily identify which probe is which. I'll try and put them on there. 
Okay, they're on there. Fairly standard thing, times one times ten. And we have little uh, plastic covers we can put over the end as well, just to uh, cover over the ground terminal. Like so. Okay. Yeah, these are also useful, they were useful for probing around IC so that you can effectively not slip off the leg of the IC and that's useful for like through all type ICs but surface mount ones probably not a lot and we have the standard uh, clip on type probes as well, can be useful. So that's what's in the box, these are the uh, ground terminals. No, seem quite usable. Clicks on quite well. That was a good solid attachment. So we have those. Okay, let's have a look at the oscilloscope then. I'll just take a quick look at the specifications of this. So 100 meg samples per second, analog bandwidth of 15 megahertz, input and pin is 1 meg. Um, maximum input voltage, this is what I was interested in. So, plus and minus 40 volts on a 1 times probe or 400 volts on a 10 times probe. These probes are switchable, so we could use it on a high voltage circuit. A 100 nanoseconds per division to 1 second per division on the horizontal and 10 millivolts to 10 volts per division on the vertical. One thing I know this oscilloscope does not support is XY mode. So you can't look at litigious figures and that sort of thing on it. So it does have that missing, which is a bit of a shame really, because that can actually be quite useful in certain cases. But I guess you can't have everything in these things. And I think it's fairly common with digital oscilloscopes that they don't implement the XY facility properly for some reason. Maybe it's too difficult. Yeah, I don't know why they don't do that. Um, so we get measurements anyway for frequency cycle, duty cycle. Frequency cycle duty. Okay. <laughs> I thought duty cycle was one thing. Um, Pulse width, voltage peak to peak, RMS, average, max, minimum. Inbuilt signal generator, 10 hertz to 8 megahertz square wave, and 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz sine wave, triangular wave, and sawtooth. So that's what we actually have here. I've had a little look around at this just to familiarise myself a little bit with it. And it's actually really quite simple to use. In fact, I very much like the user interface on this. So first of all, let's just attach a signal. I'm going to connect it to my signal generator, which is set to 10 kilohertz. So we'll just put a signal onto it. Okay. What you basically have here is this little thumb wheel. This is like a rotary encoder. So if you see as I move it, it goes around the various options on the screen, okay? So these options set the signal generator. If you want to change a setting, you just move the other one. See, sawtooth, triangle, yeah, square. This is your time base, yeah. Okay, you can see. This is your trigger mode, single, slow, auto. And the little thumb wheel goes in both directions, so you can easily move backwards and forwards. You don't have to go around the whole screen to get back to the next item. Okay. This is your trigger, so you have the various options, so you have a less than, greater than. Rising edge, falling edge, yeah. The trigger level was on the next one. So here, if you see the little blue dotted line here, I've put it inside the waveform. 
So at the moment I'm displaying the blue trace, which is, if you like, channel 1, this is channel 2, yeah, or A and B. We can go across, uh, X position moves the display side to side. Then you have your various channels. Now channel C and D, which are the digital channels, I'll just switch them off for the moment. But I will show you what we can do with them before. So basically this option allows you to play back recordings or to record from the various channels, okay? Dash dash means it's off. Go to this one, the violet one at the bottom, the magenta one. This has some interesting options. So this has options, obviously that's off. Uh, this will show you the inverse of B. So B is the yellow one, A is the cyan one. Inverse of A, so the A field gives the inverse of this waveform. Uh, this is C or D, so this is two logic levels. So when either logic level on input C and D here are high, it will trigger. Yes, C and D are logical, and uh, A minus B. So this is effectively, you can put two signals, one into A and one into B, and this will display A minus B, the subtraction of the voltage at any given instance. Yeah, A plus B, channel C, and off. So we'll switch it off, okay? Let's go across to the one which we're using. Let's just alter the sensitivity so we actually get a better display, okay? So we're on point one of a volt now. The other one, the yellow one, again, we can switch it to DC or AC. We can switch it off. Huh? I'll just put it off for the moment. So we just have the one channel. And again, this is your coupling AC or DC. Okay. So AC effectively will float to the middle if you like. And DC is a DC offset. I can actually adjust that with my signal generator. Yeah. I'm just altering the DC offset. So that's working now on just the one trace. Okay, here it is showing us it has 480 millivolts. That's the amplitude. Frequency is 10 kilohertz, which is exactly what it's set on my signal generator. Okay, we can then, for example, change the waveform. That is supposedly a square wave. I'm not sure exactly how good my El Cheapo signal generator is. I'll just show you what I'm using. So that is the actual signal generator there. Okay. Triangle wave, sine wave, and square wave, so it says. Let's try some different frequencies. The display is not working very well on the function generator, by the way. It's an old thing. But we can increase the frequency. And I'm just now increasing the frequency. You can see. I'm now on, let's see. Can we go up to 100 kilohertz? 100 kilohertz, yeah, and on the oscilloscope now I can just change the time base quite easily, so we just come back, okay, and there we are, in fact it's now showing a nice square wave, let's go to triangle sine wave, okay, now I'll take it up in frequency. So this signal generator will go up to 10 megahertz. Okay, I'm now on 10 megahertz. So let's see. Select the option. And it's showing us here frequency 10 megahertz, voltage peak to peak. Turn it down a little bit. I've changed the frequency. Let's just reduce the amplitude, so we're down into quite a, a weak signal now, yeah, 50 millivolts, and it's still 30 odd millivolts, and it's still triggering on it, so it's triggering quite nicely on a low level signal. That's the actual maximum on my signal generator, about half a volt peak to peak. 
Okay, so we can see it works fine at 10 megahertz. Now, what I have noticed when I was playing around with this, and I'll just try it again, this button is like a play and stop. Yeah, so you can effectively like just freeze the waveform there. Okay. This stepping in the waveform may well be in my signal generator because this is what's called a DDS signal generator counter. It's digitally generated basically. If you press the button again, it runs. Yeah, it's in run mode. Now, what I want to just show you is if I turn the time base down so I'm nowhere near being able to display it. I get some rather odd waveforms of this, yeah. And there, at 2 milliseconds, it's telling me that the frequency is 244 hertz. So it's actually giving me a stable sine wave on the display at nothing like the frequency of the signal. And I find that a little bit strange. Let's just go even lower. Yeah, you, so you see, what it's doing is, it's, it's actually at these points giving us a stable display. And I find that a bit odd. Yeah, if we go on back to the actual range, as you can see, it's again at 10 megahertz. So as I increase the time base, look, it loses the frequency reading, yeah? And that could, I suppose, become a bit confusing if you're doing repair work, whereby you think you've got a 240 hertz signal, it's actually 10 megahertz. <laughs> so uh, I'm not really sure why it does that, but I thought I should mention it. And maybe Miniware will come along and explain why it does that. This signal generator only goes up to 10 megahertz, but I have another one that goes up to 255 megahertz. So we can have a little play soon and we can actually see how it responds. What happens when we go above 15 megahertz, which is the actual rated bandwidth of the oscilloscope. But for now, I want to show you something else. So I'll put it back down to 10 kilohertz. What I'm going to do now is put the other channel on, okay? So we'll just go across to this channel, channel B, and we will set it to DC. Now I've actually connected a signal to this, so this is connected to the test point on my oscilloscope, which I believe is a one kilohertz square wave. Okay. So we'll just turn the sensitivity of the scope up a little bit. Okay, so that is a signal coming from my oscilloscope. Now, this analog oscilloscope is 30 odd years old and it's a little bit iffy if you ask me. So I'm not sure if that noise is on the signal. It's probably on my oscilloscope actually. And you can see that the frequency is flashing in here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trigger on that signal, okay? Now to do that, we go over to trigger, okay? And we press this one. You see it's changed to yellow. Okay, so I can now trigger on that waveform. I'm just going to alter the time base slightly. There. So you can see I've now got both waveforms displaying, yeah? And I can stop it there. And we can see that the frequency from my signal generator is 10 kilohertz, and the frequency from my oscilloscope test point is 900 hertz, okay? So that's just demonstrating using the oscilloscope with two signals at once. I'll just now alter the amplitude of the waveform and I'll show you what this actually does here. So if we go back over to channel A, right, we now have a smaller waveform, okay? And now let's go to channel B and we now have a smaller waveform, okay? Now what I can do with this is this one YP. This is the Y axis or the vertical position. So 
I can switch using this between yellow, which is channel B, channel C, channel D, which is a green, channel A, yeah, and then I can actually alter it. So using this, I can actually, you can see, I'm moving the channel A down, or I can move it up. Okay. So that's how you actually change the position of the... Now I can press this button again, and it's changed to yellow, and now we can actually alter the position of that one. Okay. So we now move that one down there as well. And we can set the trigger point, so we can actually tell it to trigger at the moment, we tell it to trigger on the yellow one. And you see it's not triggering because the trigger point is above the waveform, so let's just go and adjust that. Okay. Put the trigger point inside the waveform, look at it's triggered. Okay, so that's the basic use of the oscilloscope. And I must admit, once you get used to using these two little encoder wheels, it's actually really quite nice to use this. Yeah, and I quite like the pause thing as well. You can actually have a look at things in there, various voltages and such like. So that's the basic use of it. Now, one of the advantages of having an oscilloscope like this, which is battery powered, is that it's isolated from the mains. So I thought I could probably use this effectively on uh, high voltage circuits such as power supply switch mode power supplies because i can connect the ground lead of the scope to hot ground okay and it's not going to effectively cause a short to ground it's not going to blow any fuse or do anything nasty but when i had a close look at it i can't actually do that with it and i just want to show you why so there's my test meter on continuity I'm just going to, well, touch the leads together, we have continuity. So this is attached to one of the oscilloscope probes, the ground clip. So this is what you would clip to your circuit that you're working on. This effectively, on a hot ground, would, it be, would it effectively be half mains voltage, or all the mains voltage half the time, yeah. But you'll see that if we look at the continuity to here, the metal work where the sockets are, that's continu continuity, yeah. So the whole casing, if I even got the back of it, yeah, well, if, there was a, if there was a scratch on this, which there isn't, I'm not going to scratch it. But you would have continuity to hot ground. So you can't use this as it is safely to monitor waveforms on high voltage circuits for different reasons that you can't use your bench oscilloscope. Your bench oscilloscope is grounded, so as soon as you switch on, you're connecting the mains to ground, to earth, you're going to blow the earth leakage trips and probably some fuses. In this case, it won't do that, but the whole thing becomes live, it's not safe to touch, yeah? But there is a way around that, which I'll show you shortly, where you could use this safely on high voltage circuits such as switch mode power supplies. But in the meantime, let's have a look how this responds to frequencies above 15 megahertz. I've now attached the oscilloscope to my RF signal generator. So you can see, I think in the window here, that I have it set to 7.2 megahertz. And this is showing me an approximation of a sine wave at 7.2 megahertz. Now this little clock generator on here we were discussing on a previous video as a project it doesn't always give a perfect sine wave because effectively it's using a clock generator to make the frequencies but what we can do you see i can just increase the frequency on here and you can see it's increasing so 7.31 this is really 7.30 7.32 now let's go up in frequency so the next band is 10 megahertz okay so I'll just set the time base, yeah, the time base is on the minimum, yeah, 10, 100 nanoseconds. So it's displaying our 10 megahertz. Now let's go up again. So next band is 11.78, that's saying 11.8. Okay. 13.63, and it's still working. That's 14.1 megahertz. 
and that's 15 megahertz that's basically the bandwidth of my oscilloscope so what happens if we go above 15 megahertz because unless you're into vhf radio repair and such like probably 25 megahertz as much as you really need that allows you to measure clock crystals on things like graphics cards and motherboard so let's try taking the frequency up and see what happens so we're now on 17.6 and it's still reading it the waveform's a little bit squiggly but it's good enough to tell you you actually have a clock frequency at that yeah 21.525 again it's a little bit jittery but it would tell you the clock was running and for repair work that's probably all you need okay so we're now up to 27 megahertz which is above what you need for testing motherboard clocks and such like yeah and it's still actually showing you that there's a clock there 28.4 and it's still showing you there's a clock there but it's no longer showing you the frequency and that's about it yeah that's about as far as you can go with it it's now on 50 megahertz and it's not i mean you could say it's showing you there's a clock there but that's about the best you could say so i've put it back down to 7.2 megahertz again we'll just do that 10 it's reading the frequency 11.8 13.6 14.1 15 is reading it it reads it above that 21 megahertz it still reads the frequency and then that cuts out when i'm at 27 okay so we can definitely use this for repair work to determine if we have a clock at frequencies higher than the stated bandwidth and i actually think that's very good I mean, it may not be giving you the tidiest waveform, but often for repair work, all you want to know is, is the clock running? Yeah. So that I am quite impressed with. Here we have a switch mode power supply. It's a 12 volt power supply from an old satellite receiver, and it is working. So what I want to demonstrate is how you would go about viewing the waveform on the pulse width modulator. That's this chip here safely okay so first of all i'll explain to you what the problem actually is and why we need to consider how we would actually do this this is the data sheet for the controller chip on this power supply and there's a typical application so you can see you have the mains voltage coming in through a bridge rectifier charges a large capacitor and then this is the transformer coil and this is the MOSFET built inside the chip itself. So basically the chip switches this MOSFET on and off and that drives the transformer coil and induces voltage into the secondary. So that's basically how it works. Now you'll notice that the chip is connected to ground and also if I just zoom in a little bit, this capacitor is also connecting to ground but you'll see that ground is actually one end of the bridge rectifier and via the diodes this is connected to the mains so you cannot connect something connected to safety ground this symbol is safety ground to here for example a bench oscilloscope that's connected to the mains that's grounded because if you do what happens is via the diode you connect live a neutral to ground basically so it will just cause a fuse to blow or most likely just trip out the earth leakage trip it might damage the thing you want to test it might damage your oscilloscope so to avoid that you could use an oscilloscope which isn't grounded the problem there is the oscilloscope itself will float at the voltage half of the main so on the 220 volt mains 240 volt your oscilloscope will be sitting at 120 volts basically so it's not safe to touch it now if you have an oscilloscope meter something that is all plastic that's insulated like a multimeter that's fine but this little oscilloscope is not it has a metal case and this is why you can't use it safely but there is a way to do it so if you think about it 
when you measure the waveform here on this chip, basically what you want to know is what is the voltage difference between here and ground. Okay? Ground is the other end of the circuit. It's here, it's here. So all you're really doing is looking for the voltage difference between ground and the output. And we can do that using this oscilloscope without connecting to ground. And I'll show you how we can do it. So to see the difference in voltage between hot ground and the output of our chip, we can use the maths function built into this little oscilloscope. And this is nothing specific to this. You can do this on pretty much any digital oscilloscope, including the bench ones, and even on some analog oscilloscopes, you have this facility. But the ideal thing about doing it with this is you don't have to worry about accidental grounds and such like. All you really need to do is connect your probes. So the first one, this is actually a uh, channel two. The yellow one, although I put the green band on, I plugged them in the wrong way round, it doesn't matter. And this is, in fact, channel one, okay? And what we can do is, on our oscilloscope, if we go to channel C, okay? We can then go through the various maths options. And we want the difference between A and B, which is basically A minus B there a minus b so that's the mode we need and with that we can monitor the difference in the two voltages without ever making a connection from the ground of our oscilloscope to hot ground there is one thing we need to bear in mind and that's that this oscilloscope can handle up to 40 volts input with a times one probe but 400 volts on a times 10 and these probes are switchable so I've actually set the probes to times 10 on the switch. And that means that I will not effectively overload the oscilloscope. So we can now try it. I've now switched the power supply on so it is running. There's no load on it at the moment. Well, let's have a look at the waveforms. So first of all, the yellow trace, this is the hot ground, okay? And if we switch that on, there you can see a 50 hertz signal, mains frequency. That is hot ground. Okay. Now, let's put on the trace one, the cyan one. Okay. That is the output from the chip. So you can see the hot ground is there because the whole circuit, I'm not connecting any ground to it. So we have that, but I'm sure you can see little bursts of data. What this is, is the chip sending a pulse, a little pulse into the output transformer. Because there's no load, it's kind of, kind of like into this pulsed mode. We can put a load on afterwards and we should see it actually run continuously. But if we want to see how just the waveform loops, we need to use the mass function and what we need to do is actually subtract A from B, okay? So let's go over to the function on the magenta one, yeah? And let's go to A minus B. So in the middle now you can see that, yeah? That's one minus the other. You can see the little burst of data, if you like, or well, not data, the, the pulse coming from the pulse width modulator. What we can now do is we can actually switch off the other two traces. And all we're left with is the difference between the two, which is exactly what we wanted to see. Okay. And you can see in there, that's the little pulse, the thing it's triggering. If I pause it, I can probably get it to pause. There. So we actually have one of the pulses. It's there, yeah. It's now triggering on it. So that's how we can actually view the output from the chip without connecting the ground to the actual circuit. Okay, so we can definitely see it there, yeah? Let's switch the mains power off now. So I've switched the mains off. And you can see it's still running, it's still pulsing, yeah? 
and gradually the main capacitor will discharge and it will stop. Okay, it's quite a large capacitor, it holds quite a high voltage actually. I can actually take my multimeter on volts range and we can have a look. I think it's actually stopped now just about. Let's see how much voltage is in the large capacitor. So just from here to here. There's 10 volts in it now, it's almost discharged, yeah? So let's connect a load to our transformer and then let's try it again so the power supply has got an output and then let's see how it looks. Okay, so I've connected, uh, I can just show you with this camera, uh, there's a power supply, I have some power resistors here connecting across the output, okay? So I've put about 15 ohms load on it which draws a bit less than one amp. So we now have a load on the power supply. So now it should actually run continuously rather than that kind of burst mode. I'll just move over to the uh, time base setting in case I want to change it. Okay, so let's power our power supply up again. And now it's running, you can see it's running, yeah. So you can actually see the power supply is running. So that is how you display a waveform from a power supply connected to hot ground without actually connecting to ground. And it's safe, yeah, this is no voltage on this, okay? One other thing I've noticed while I've been using this oscilloscope to make this video is it shuts down after a period of time of inactivity. If there's no signal and you're not doing anything, it just shuts down. If you touch any of the buttons, it just comes back on again. So it will effectively save the battery if you forget to switch it off. So I have to sum this up and I have a number of thoughts about it. So firstly, it has some strange quirks that I've noticed, especially the one where I could put a 10 megahertz signal in, get it to display 10 megahertz, see the sine wave and then change the time base down and get it to show a nice sine wave again and tell me it was 200 hertz, yeah? That to me just doesn't make sense, I don't know whether that's some sort of bug in the firmware and I'm sure many well will be watching this review so if you guys would like to get into the comments and explain what is causing that to happen? Is it just some sort of bug I found? Talking about firmware with this device, this is open source. So you can download the schematics, you can download the source code for the microcontroller, for the FPGA chips that you're doing the hard work inside here. And if that's your sort of thing you like programming those sort of devices you can actually write your own software for this there are already some third-party implementations available on the internet if you just search ds213 firmware and you can upload them easily by using the micro usb also with the micro usb you can download data from here onto your pc in various formats one is a csv or comma separated values which you can load into Excel and then plot waveforms and such like with that if that's the sort of thing you want to play around with for any reason for me for repair work it's probably not something I need to do which is why I didn't investigate that but it does have the facility price wise I think it's a little bit expensive I will say I think it's a little bit expensive but it's extremely well made extremely well made I will say that and it feels like a good quality piece of kit it would be ideal for working with on site and we can get those protective covers which I would recommend if you want to use this on site so it's then effectively drop proof and it's you know much less likely to come into any harm once in your tool bag 
and I'd be very happy to use this on site, without a doubt. The scope probes are included, which is very nice, but bear in mind they have these non-standard fittings. I haven't seen this type before. I've never tried to find any. So how easy it is to get replacement probes, I'm not sure. I'm sure you could go and Google that. But normally scope probes last rather a long time, to be quite honest. But it's something to bear in mind, that you can't just fit a standard BNC scope probe there. So there isn't the space, basically, to do that. You see it has a battery saver on. In fact, you've just seen it go off on its own. And if I just touch a dial or something, it comes back to the previous settings. So it does have a battery saver. I've used it for quite a while in this video, and obviously off camera as well, where I've been trying to work out how to use it a little bit. The battery life seems good. It seems to be several hours between charge. It's certainly plenty enough to be using this on site again or away from a charger. And you can connect it to a standard phone charger. So charging it shouldn't be a problem or run it from a power pack if you want to do that for using it for very long periods of time. How this compares to other handheld oscilloscopes, especially cheaper ones i don't know i have seen cheaper ones which at least claim to have a wider bandwidth than this one whether they really do i don't know i'm sure at some point in the near future i will get around to reviewing some of those devices but this one definitely worked above its stated bandwidth of 15 megahertz i'm not saying it displayed a perfect signal but for repair work, normally, if you want to know, for example, on an oscillator, 25 megahertz, is it oscillating or not? This always will show you the oscillation, yeah? Usually, if an oscillator fails in electronic repair, it fails. It either oscillates or it don't, yeah? The actual waveform is not totally relevant to repair work. So I'm quite happy with that. I'm quite happy with the way it worked up to around 25 megahertz. It makes it very useful then for working on things like graphics cards and motherboards and similar devices. If you come across frequencies higher than that, obviously you're going to be working like VHF radio, UHF. Sure, this isn't really for you. But for other sorts of repair work, it, it fits the bill. Yeah. So to finally sum up, really it's a really nice little device without a doubt i very much like it i do think it's a little bit pricey but if you're in the market for one you've got a bit of money to spare i don't think you will be disappointed for one minute with this okay but you have to make your own mind up i can't really recommend you on this one yay or nay i was very fortunate to be sent one and i will be using this on my repair videos it's probably easier for me to use and my bench oscilloscope when I'm making videos and I very much like the way it's isolated from the mains and I was taking those uh, voltages on the uh, switch mode power supplies. Okay guys, so over to you. I'm sure you'll have lots of things to say about it in the comments below. Yeah, I hope you feel that was a fair review. If not, let me know why and I will see you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now guys.